Good morning, everybody. Good morning. A very warm welcome to The Future is Northern, brought to you by XR Stories and Sign. That's the Screen Industries Growth Network. Two projects directly supported by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and Research England. It's very, very good to see everybody in the room today. Having started our sign project under lockdown conditions, I can't tell you how much of a thrill it is to see people in person um, and here sharing the day with us today. We're here today to explore skills and training, what skills and training are needed for those working in or wishing to work in the creative industries as well as what the future of public service broadcasting might be for young people. What will the audiences be watching in the future? And how can we equip our creatives of the future to make content that these audiences will demand? How can the screen industries become more inclusive and accessible? Just two of the really big questions we hope to explore today. I ought to introduce myself. I'm Professor Jude Brereton from the School of Arts and Creative Technologies at the University of York. And I'm the co-director of SIGN and I've also been the academic lead for the skills and training work stream on SIGN. Um, there are many, many of my colleagues from both SIGN and XR Stories here today. Um, do please chat to us. Uh, we will make ourselves um, available to you for discussions and introduce ourselves. There's too many of you, SIGN and XR Stories people, to introduce everybody now. Lots to come. A few quick housekeeping um, items, and then I will introduce Kate, our keynote speaker. Food and drink is going to be served in the refuel room, which is a room behind this one. And you'll also notice that that's where the um, doors to the toilets are as well. You will have come through those before you enter today. Um, we've got a session this morning and then lunch will be served at 12.45. We will also have some short breaks throughout the day. We're not expecting a fire alarm, so if we do hear the fire alarm, we do need to just leave in an orderly fashion and people from the venue and our own stewards will help you to do that. Please do um, sign up for the breakout sessions. Um, there'll be a sign-up sheet coming round during our first break this morning. That's the breakout sessions before and after lunch. If you're online, welcome, everybody online. I'm not sure how many of you are joining us online. If you'd like to post any questions to any of our speakers through the day, please do so on Twitter and use the hashtag FIN2023. So that's hashtag F for Freddie, I for India, N for November 2023. So now I'll introduce our keynote speaker. We're really thrilled to have Kate as our keynote today. She's been with us throughout XR Stories and Science Journeys. She's a highly experienced and senior consultant in the creative industry, working in both private and the public sector clients in the UK and internationally. She's the executive chair of Animation UK, which is now part of the UK Screen Alliance, the trade body for visual effects, post-production and film studios. XR Stories and Sign have benefited hugely from Kate's expertise. We really have, Kate. We would not have achieved what we have, and we wouldn't even be here today without your careful counsel and advice, and for which we and I and all my colleagues at XR Stories and Sign are forever grateful. Kate's a co-director for both projects, so she's very busy, and she's also chair of the Partnership Steering Board, keeping us on the straight and narrow. There's much, much more I could say about Kate, but I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to cut to the chase and let you take over the floor. Um, Kate O'Connor, please do set us off on our um, conference today. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> ah, I was going to say, Jude, can you be my agent, please? Um, no, that was so lovely. I'm, I'm feeling very uh, touched with that. Um, hi, everyone. Um, uh, I, I'm really delighted to open up the conference this morning. I think keynote might be a tad of an exaggeration. I like to manage expectations. I thought I was just going to say a few words to open up the conference. Then when I said that to Jude this morning, she said, OK, we can cut you down to five minutes. And I said, no, oh, wow. no, I've written something. I want to say it now. Um, so um, as someone who spent you know, a huge, huge chunk of my life working in the field of skills, 
in the screen industries and in the creative industries generally. I just want to say, and I'd written this down, it's not on the back of those kind words from Jude, I just want to say that um, now as, as uh, co-director of XR Stories and sign the Screen Industries Growth Network, a few people have asked me what that meant this morning, so I'm going to keep saying that, um, I just want to say from the outset that I think the work done by the team in XR Stories and Sign is... In terms of collaboration, in, cl in terms of reaching out with the partnership between industry and education, education and education, across the region, I think, honestly, Cards on the Table, this is the best example I've seen in, in all my decades of working in the screen industries in the field of, of skills. And I think um, that bodes pretty well for the North, um, amongst many other things. So I think today's agenda is a perfect illustration of that. The agenda is rich in research, it's reflective, it's challenging, covers that huge range of topics that Jude's mentioned already through to what about the audience, which everyone usually forgets, through to skills and training, hardcore, and the very important um, equality, diversity and inclusion issues. But listen, I have prepared a speech and I am going to Blimmin' we'll read it, Jude, even if it does take more than five minutes, because it's so uncharacteristic. Um, so, so I'm going to do it. So we all know the screen industries are an important part of the UK economy. And the region of Yorks and Humberside, and for those in the northwest and northeast, you too, um, uh, are facing a number of skills challenges. From skill shortages to a lack of diversity, these challenges can have a real impact on the ability of companies in the region to compete and to grow. But there's reason to be optimistic. Yorkshire and the North East and North West um, <laughs> is home to some of the most talented and creative people in the industry. And there are a number of initiatives underway to address these skills issues. One of the most promising initiatives is the development of apprenticeships and training programs. I'm not going to go on there because I know there's a whole session on it. Another important initiative is the work being done to increase diversity in the industry. This means actively recruiting and supporting people from underrepresented groups and creating more inclusive and welcoming workplace culture. Another thing that's going to be talked about today. And finally, it's important to recognise uh, the need for ongoing learning and development, critical to the development of the screen industries, which is constantly evolving with new technologies and trends, Q XL stories, and it's crucial that companies in Yorkshire invest in their workers' ongoing training and development to keep up with these changes. In conclusion, but it's not, the screen industries in Yorkshire are facing some significant, uh, North East, North West, um, are facing some significant skills challenges. But there are also many reasons to be optimistic with the right investments in training, diversity, ongoing learning and development. We can ensure the industry in the north, and finally changed it, remains strong and competitive for years to come. Thank you, except for it's not thank you. Because, and here's the dramatic pause, although doing this is a bit kind of old hat now, I was playing around with open AI. AI. I was having a look at chat G. PT, thank you, um, at, on Friday, thinking, oh, I wonder how fluent it is. I wonder if it can write me a speech. It did. It was that. It was that word for word, pretty much without any prompting, just, you know, write me a speech. I'm speaking at a skills conference uh, on Monday. And that's what it came out with. And so uh, it was pretty anodyne. It was pretty standard. It was nice and short, Jude, but I'm still going on. And because um, they're not factoring in the human stubbornness. And um, it was actually when it was pinging back out that I, two things really struck me. Two things really struck me um, heavily. Um, the first was that note of optimism. That was, that was the word that came out twice, three times in a very short speech. You can be optimistic. But the other thing that I thought was really interesting is... That I could have written, or any of you probably could have written, mm, seven years ago when I was working with Screen Yorkshire on the growth plan for Yorkshire, um, and we were looking at skills. I could have written it ten years ago when I was still at Creative Skills. That I probably could have written it 25 years, I'm saying it out loud, when I was the founding member of what was then um, Skillset. So, optimistic. I mean, come on, it feels a bit like Groundhog Day. You know, we've been saying this 
for decades. You know, and, and set against the undoubted growth of the industry. I mean, it's so growing so fast, AI is not even keeping up with the stats, and I'm certainly not even trying. But I do know that the creative industries, the screen industries, are growing more than most other industries. I think I'm pretty safe in saying that. And I think Yorkshire in the north is the biggest growing region outside the north, uh, outside the southwest. But we still have gaps and shortages more. They're at every level, in every grade. Uh, they're not just at entry level, they're at senior level. We've got lack of diversity, not just, I remember doing a campaign about gender diversity, it's now every single underrepresented characteristic across the industry. Technological change, well, who knew? You know, it just changes all the time and we're not on top of it. Um, and the, the really important need for better working practices, culture change, systemic change, pay, working hours, all those things, I mean, geez, how long do we have to keep talking about it? So, so I read it, and that's what I thought. So I didn't feel very optimistic, but I pulled myself together, and then I did think, it has said we have reason to be optimistic. There must be reason to be optimistic. <laughs> so, because I live my life by open AI now. So, um, but then it didn't take me long to think that we do have reason to be optimistic. And, um, you know, I think there is a real, real refresh and new climate change. And partly... Um, that's about the kind of work that you guys do, but in particular I'm going to mention my colleagues at Sign and XL Stories, which is powering the conversation by deep research, um, by absolute application, by determination to break down some of those walls. And the world of training and skills in the screen industries has been, I think, characterised by a culture of blame for as long as I've been in it. Oh, like, what's the government doing about training the workforce of the film and TV and games industry? Well, hello, we're not the NHS. <laughs> you know, this is a very, very rich industry making lots of profits, and why, why is the government res responsible for that in, on one basic level? Or what's the BFI or Screen Skills doing about it? Again, hello, you know, whose responsibility is it? But they do have a responsibility, and they are... I'm coming on to that in a minute, galvanising um, some new thoughts around that. But there's always been this thing, and some of you might even remember me, me being at the front of this. Well, what the hell? What are further and higher education are doing about this? Why aren't they churning out oven-ready 1990s term or fit for purpose, probably more recent, softer talk, to support the industry? And then the industry, well, what can we do? It's all, they're all freelancers. So it's like pass the parcel, blame game. You know, who takes responsibility? That's why we have to be optimistic, in my view, because just this year, and after the BFI's skills review last year, the BFI have firmly put the responsibility and leadership for tackling the skills um, uh, crisis where it belongs, with the industry. And in fact, only in the last month, the skills task force has been set up, instigated by the BFI, but now totally independent of any organisation. It's their job to come up with a plan. If they want a vibrant, growing industry, it's the industry that has to lead it. I feel very optimistic about that. And I also feel extremely optimistic about a new spirit of collaboration where people don't worry about turf wars or borders or who's responsible for doing what, but genuinely come together. This is an example of that. So underpinned by deep research and analysis, supported by high quality education and training, infused with real principles of equality, diversity and inclusivity, facilitated by investment that's not always public sector. It has to be industry. We're short of 90 million or something. And delivered through collaboration we have, we have that chance of being optimistic and making huge progress. And here you have it today, in the North. The future is the North. The skills, cracking the skills solution in collaboration, as uh, brought to you by XL Stories and Sign, is the way forward. So I leave you, hopefully, with a sense of optimism and a big frustration from Jude because I've gone on way too long, Soz. And I will leave you to um, but be with you on the journey of discuss discussing through all the sessions later today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kate.
Um, my name's Nikki Stearman. I'm a creative producer at XR Stories, and it's my great delight and pleasure to introduce three new XR Stories research projects funded by the AHRC. Um, these projects present an exploration of what the future of public service broadcasting could be for young people. Good luck, guys. <laughs> so the three projects, I'm going to introduce the three projects and then I think I'll invite each of the researchers to come up one at a time if that's okay. So the three projects are Future, um, well, let's change the title actually, Future of Broadcast Media According to Kids, led by Dr. Dylan Yamanda Rice and Dr. Eleanor Dare of Extraordinary Stories. Um, we hope they'll present their findings on how um, 7 to 11 year olds might consume, create future TV content. After them, we'll have Untold Stories, led by Chol Theatre and Arts Company, and Dr. Becky Parry, who uh, will present their work um, with groups of young women from Bradford, as they are invited to imagine the future of broadcasting as a means of storytelling. And then finally, we'll have Interactive Broadcast Futures, led by Dr. Rob Eagle and the BFI, who will explore how Gen Z audiences, ages 16 to 24, envision future formats and technologies of screen-based entertainment. So I've got an exciting, action-packed morning for you. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome to the stage, please, Dr. Dylan and Dr. Eleanor. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> that might not be an easy fix back on. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's been a bad morning for you already. <laughs> well, just with me. <laughs> I should ask. Uh, so whilst he's uh, sorting that out, um, my, my name's uh, Dylan, as Nikki said. I've got several uh, hats on. I work part-time in academia, part-time in a video games company, and then part-time for our company, Extraordinary Stories. Um, so when I was listening to your talk, um, Kate, I was going to think, I was thinking, what is my optimism? And I think my optimism is always children. Um, and we were lucky enough to do a project with children. And um, whenever I get pessimistic, which is quite often, I think hearing what younger children, so children under 10 in particular, what they think the future will be, um, I mean, there are bleak things in amongst that for children, but by and large, there's, there's a lot of optimism in that as well. Um, so our remit, um, so I'm just going to talk for 10 minutes and then Eleanor will. Um, so our remit was kind of to work with 7 to 11-year-olds um, and try to engage them in the process of thinking about the future of broadcast um, media. So um, I've told you roughly who I am. I like to call myself an information experience design researcher. What I mean by that is I'm trying to use my skills as an artist, as a designer, in amongst the ways in which we collect information from children. So rather than just talking to them, for example, how can we use the emerging technologies or how can we use open AI? How can we use these things even with young children so that they're beginning to critique them, engage with them, and we're thinking about what it might mean for them to use them in, among, in amongst the research as well. So like most things, um, none of this just is a standalone project. These are things that uh, we've worked on previously and have also led into my thoughts on this project as well. So if you're interested, you can download any of these uh, reports online. Just, just Google them. Um, <laughs> no time to talk about them. <laughs> um, but again, when we talk about the future of stories, um, something that I often want to uh, bring up to students is sort of thinking about how do stories change? So some of you might be familiar with Dr. Zeus's Green Eggs and Ham. So, you know, when we tell Green Eggs and Ham as a book, then that might change where we could read it. So for example, we could potentially read it in a bath because it's made of paper. Um, when we have it as an app, then we bring in sound and we, we bring in movement, but we also lose a part. So Gunther Kress talks about losses and gains in a work. So anything that we add, we also lose. So you know you might lose your imagination on, on how the characters sound and so on. And the third one, which I'll leave you again to Google on, on YouTube for fear of breaking the system again, um, is, a, is a blues version of Green Eggs and Ham from YouTube, where you've got somebody sort of singing it uh, with classical guitar and so on. And of course, again, that changes the concept of who might be the audience, you know, 
probably then it's shifted away from being for children to being for adults. So again, this really thinking about how do modes change with technologies. Oh, it looks like it is going to play it for you. No, we're going to go past it. <laughs> and again, how do we then think about the best match between platform and mode for the story that we want to tell? And I think because of working with children for so long or in the design space for children, often people come and they're like, I want to make an AR experience or I want to make this thing. And you're like, OK, well, what's the thing? I don't know yet. And you're like, well, that's kind of the wrong way around. You know, you need to know what the story is in order to know, is this the best, the best technology? Maybe that's not surprising for some of you here. So again, this was just a, a project looking at uh, designing um, a kit, a mixed realities play kit that could help children have an MRI scan. And there were all these possibilities within that, VR, AR, apps, physical play. How do you take different aspects of that process and match them to the platform? And this was kind of the starting point, I think, for our project of saying, OK, if we turn up to kids and show them photogrammetry, we show them AI, we talk to them about game design, we show them VR headsets, but also what's the story? How might that shift and change in relation to that? Um, so again, this was back in 2015, looking at the, uh, what VR might mean for children. We've almost sort of killed that in COVID and now slowly coming back, back to it again. Um, but this made me think about how we were trying to design a set of be best practices. So not to kind of say all kids must sit down when they do VR, but as we're thinking about this, what is best for children as the audience is how, how can we bring them in? So if we're thinking about skill sets and, and them being part of the skill sets, um, and so on, what might best practices look like there as well. Um, and then one of the most exciting things I think about emerging technologies is just this ability to shift between technique, which is reality, and, and magic. So how can we use these things to do the things that children can't do in real life? And I think a lot of stuff that gets created for children, like edgy games and so on, are replications of things that they're doing in, in schools, worksheets or books or, or, or whatever and actually we know kids are smarter than that and that's where the optimism is that when they go home they're not doing any of those things you know so we really need to chase them and find out what are they doing what what do they want where's their imagination going with with this um, and all the work that we do is thinking about it as being socially culturally situated we've heard a lot about the the north you know it situating this within the uk what might it mean globally and uh, and so on so Again, a really nice episode of Sesame Street in the Zoom format for, for kids coming out during COVID. Um, and again, this, this was thinking about why seances were so popular just after World War II, um, because people were wanting to reconnect you know, with, with the dead, uh, essentially, but also thinking about why VR and the unknown, the mysterious, what can't we do in reality? Why now? Why is that appealing right now? Could it be that we're pretty much in this disaster era of wars and so on, like the opportunity to, to escape. Um, and that leads us uh, to here. Uh, we decided to use the Beano um, a little bit by default, I might say, because I'd accidentally ordered way too much stuff on eBay of the Beano, thinking I was just putting in offers, but actually I'd bought it all. So I was like, okay, well, we'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll roll with that now, I guess. Um, <laughs> but. Um, also, I was interested in it being a heritage brand. So perhaps grandparents who might come or parents, uh, even if children didn't know, that role of how does a story chop and change over history can teach us a lot about the future as well. So thinking about the printing press as you know, being very stuck, you can't change that, you know, giving you these comics that you read to right and left, and then you know, coming to, to TV, you've got Dennis the Menace, and then you've got apps and so on. So again, a bit like Green Eggs and Ham, shifting and changing around. Um, and then drawing on all the other things that we know. So, you know, object-based media, giving audiences options, kind of. I don't know, all my students said they were dull options and it didn't really do anything for them. But again, we keep, we keep experimenting. Um, live cinema, I keep, keep coming back to this being like the most successful Rocky Horror um, picture shows time warp of kind of participatory um, interaction. And I was, again, I was having this conversation with Eleanor where I was saying, 
I watched it again, and actually, on the screen, they teach you that they're going to teach you. So they pull down that flip chart, and they're like, OK, now. So they're teaching the actors as they're also teaching the audience. And we've had loads of experiments during lockdown about how to engage people at a distance that kind of could have learned a lot from going back and looking at the time warp of, of like, how, like, the simplicity of it, I think, rather than trying to get caught up in, in things. And Eleanor and I had a project looking at location-based VR gaming. Um, and this was similar, you know, like, what parts do you take to make it interactive? The physical materials of the cape, plus, you know, riding on a horse, um, plus, plus seeing the kind of imagined space within the, in the VR headset. So we gave children these prompts um, of, of the Beanos, and we gave them uh, a mess of Lego and clearly not enough Play-Doh. Play-Doh is the thing. Um, <laughs> forget the future. Um, um, and we asked them to design. We're saying, OK, so you know, 50 years from now, what, what are these characters going to look like? You can make it out of Lego. You can draw it. You can uh, use Play-Doh or, or whatever. Um, and then we showed them photogrammetry apps um, and said, OK, well, now, actually, you've made a 3D asset. That can, if you want it to, go straight up into Roblox. 147 million kids playing Roblox a week. Everyone's heard of it. They're like, whoa. So suddenly, the thing that they've made in reality, in reality, out of Play-Doh, is inside, inside Roblox. And that was a motivator to make, but also think about what does digital making. And that was... One of the findings from our project is this idea that we're siphoning off digital making and analog making. So we both work in higher education uh, as well as in this space and STEAM and STEM and fine arts and so on. Fine arts are now like, you know, kaput in schools. But actually, they're an amazing scaffolding thing for understanding what digital making can be. It's inclusive. It's accessible. It, it allows people without having to have a kind of one-to-one -one tutorial on what is unity. Uh, to take part. So again, um, Roger the Dodger's mum gets to remain in 50 years, so that was quite a highlight. Um, <laughs> but also this idea that they were grabbing everything and anything that they could to sort of stick it together and, and make the thing they wanted to make. Um, and then we did the same with world building. We put it into 360 degree circles, allowed them to film it with 360 degree cameras, watch it in a VR headset. Um, and, and just, the, the, again, the mashing together, I thought they were going to create, you know, here's my test, just use the nice pens and so on, but actually, you know, creating, tearing up the comics that we've given them, adding the Play-Doh to, to the stuff. Um, and then this is my uh, last, last slide. And I think I've been thinking, thinking about this a lot. So building within Roblox, actually, whose aesthetics are Roblox, you know? They're designed by a particular person. And when an adult looks at this, you think, oh, God, that looks a bit messy because it's jarring. But actually, even if we can then go back to question who is making these choices for children, who is designing this aesthetic of, 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 of this game? And kids were highly excited to kind of see the things that they had made and then be able to role play um, around with their stories. So that's it. I think right. to you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so I'm... I'm like Dinner, Dylan, I'm, I'm partially a, a creative practitioner, technologist, critical technologist, educator at UCL and Cambridge University. I've spent since 2005 thinking about the implications of artificial intelligence for creativity. Oops, I never really imagined um, that, that the hype cycle would accelerate so rapidly in the last, well, last few, almost weeks. And which was interesting because at the time of doing the project, I was very much thinking about the work, the new workflows that arise from AI, but also the working conditions for workers involved in generating models, which, for example, in Kenya are absolutely appalling conditions where they're paid about $2 a day uh, to do really harrowing work, filtering out obscenity and violence, often not even being told what the output is for, so being sort of kept in the dark whilst, whilst being at the coalface of this so-called fourth revolution. In my books, there is no such thing as a revolution without significant shifts in power social power. So I don't think we're, well, I mean, in, for, towards social justice, that's my construct of a revolution, not a convergence uh, of monopolistic corporate power, for example. So with that backdrop, <laughs> thank you, um, <laughs> what, children are in a really vulnerable situation around the hype cycles. And what you, you interpreted as optimism, I interpret as a neoliberal 
uh, platitudes, neoliberal platitudes, without texture, without depth, without acknowledging the reality for, for adults and children and the rest of the planet. So this was really important to me as a, as a backdrop to looking at these workflows. Um, having said that, it's there. It's going to clearly already, even as we talk today, I, I read that there's a new... Um, I'm, I've been using Blender with Stable Diffusion, but there's now um, a sort of integration so you, you can write code through Python for Blender using ChatGPT, but now it's integrated, and that's clearly the trajectory we're looking at, where you can use text to say, write me the code to create a castle and then make it explode. You know, we're on the brink of this. It's very hit and miss, which is why it's so dangerous for medicine, by the way, um, and anyone who's used it will see that, that there's a fragility, there's a brittleness, but you can, with skill, you know, hit something interesting every foot of, sort of, I don't know, 10 out of a, uh, of 100 goes. So having said that, we've, we've been looked at some really interesting workflows. For, so from children's models, um, let me just play one of our VR experiences, which I made with children's models and with a little bit of machine learning. Um, there's some sound here, so I hope we can hear that. Uh, let's see. Sounds really, really important, and it was really important when we watched children dancing with these characters in the headset. Oh, I can't hear it. It's a shame. So what was, what's really significant for me as a, as a, as a maker and a ph philosopher of technology is that our embodiment is still something that it's really, really difficult for a disembodied system to understand, and Dylan and I, time and time again, Shabina Aslam watched... Um, <laughs> watched um, the, the way children engage with materials is so deep, it's so creative, and that comes through the body, through the hand, through culture, through many sort of complex networks of meaning, which um, when we're thinking about setting uh, new types of essay assessment for students so they don't cheat with chat GPT, one thing that I think at the moment there's no way can be fabricated is what was your direct experience of the materials you worked with. How did that unfold? What did you learn through the materiality of, of the medium and your, and your own presence? So um, do you think this will be so? You see, it's dead without sound. It's absolutely dead without sound for me. But here they are anyway. Imagine music, and these are children's models made in Play-Doh, and some other models here. And this is in an Oculus Quest. Uh, and these models, I just got, got hundreds of variants using machine learning. And it was quite, you know, it was quite interesting to populate a world with loads of different mor morphologies of these kids' models. And so you would see children dancing and reaching out, trying to touch in this really interesting way. So that was Oculus Quest, but we also did, well, I also did, with the models, uh, Google uh, Cardboard. Still, you know, you can still use it. And again... My observation was children trying to, to hug, trying to touch, trying to dance with their models. And not one single child observed any difference between the £5 kit and the £500 kit. No, one, no child observed that. But again, it was a sort of enchantment with that relationship to the material that I think was so important. Um, so, there are other, yeah, so there's other interesting things... This idea of perhaps possibly collaborating with AI if there can be a different social structure, political structure around it. Here, these are children's drawings. And it's really easy to transform them into another realm of mediation. And to translate that into a game engine is so fairly straightforward. So there's a sort of multi-stability to these images which interest me philosophically. It's a, a sort of mutability, a sense of movement, which again is in some ways at odds with the fixity of representation that comes through the logic of AI, paradoxically. Um, so what else do we have? We have our own models and then we can get, yeah, this idea of the variance which we used to sort of expand the world of models to see how children react to that. And then, of course, there's just implications for the workflow. You know, it will soon reach a point where it's very easy for children to make very, very sophisticated-looking content. So these, these you know, that 
doesn't take long to create an entire sprite sheet. It takes like three seconds to create a sprite sheet. Um, okay, so that's uh, me wrapping up. And uh, of course, there's a long continuum of practice. It didn't just arise from nowhere. People have been immersed in stories for millennia, and hopefully they always will be. Thank you. Uh, Play-Doh more than Lego, <laughs> drawing, really. Yeah. Um, I think they ended up using whatever was to hand. Yeah. And we were saying that by the end of the workshops when resources were getting scarce, they were just kind of using Play-Doh lids and all kinds of things. So, And I think if you watch any young kid making, it's kind of, what can you do? You know, um, yeah, the best connected play is kind of what kids make themselves, isn't it? Bring the sound from an app plus a toy and and so on. So that kind of matching but stuff also up. also sort of intergenerational play. We observed the sort of pleasure children took in making models and, and worlds with older kids, with parents and carers and family members. That seemed like a really significant... Yeah. We talked a lot about where are those spaces now as well of kind of being able to make a big mess because everyone's so busy, you know, with parents and grandparents and other siblings and so on, like, where does that happen? If, if not at school, definitely not at secondary school now, like, where does, where does that happen? Um, but then again, seeing it in the technology and, and so on as an extension of that, yeah. But Play-Doh, we ran out of Play-Doh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Is there any other questions? Oh. Yes. Yeah. Why is it always pessimistic that young people are going to use it to cheat? I agree, I agree. I totally, I totally, well, I tell you why. Because when they realise the limits of it to, to, to originate anything really interesting and not platitudinous, the corpora corporations can only switch to a narrative of adver adver adversarial, adversarial sort of cheating and lying. That's the trajectory of the edge of technology. If it doesn't work for the thing you claim it's for, and then switch around to something else. So that's what, where we're at with, with chat GPT. Why, why, why would academics, let's say, in university, raise the same thing? Because they're driven by neoliberal imperatives of, that, have, <laughs> that, that mistake corporate needs for the needs of our students. Mm. 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 And what's what you said about um, kind of getting beyond a kind of neoliberal, simplistic optimism um, and, and the need for kind of an awareness of power in, in those conversations. I just wonder if you have any thoughts about um, possibilities for engaging more critically with hope beyond those kind of forms. Mm -hmm. of, uh, we just wrote a paper about it. Yeah, we? we just wrote a paper about <laughs> it. There are, in, there are initiatives. You know, some of the, ke the uh, Kenyan workers are, are, you know, fighting for their rights as workers to have a different power relationship to the corporations. And there's many thoughts about, Dan McKillen talks about people's councils around who owns the data and what happens to that data and identifying its entanglement with transphobia and misogyny and racism, which you know any of us who are marginalised understand is there, but is almost always glossed over. In fact, Microsoft and Google sack their AI ethics team. They've just got rid of their AI ethics. So you know, there is work to be done. I think, I think as well on a level of, a kid, of the kids themselves, I think just allowing them to question like even like who's aesthetics and so on they are you know so putting those models and stuff into think spaces that they're familiar with they are then like oh i wonder why it does always look this mm. this certain way so um yeah and also yeah but also a different construct of digital literacy which is not again just about the neoliberal imperative but enabling children to challenge the power structures is really really important and it often gets really lost in a construction of skill which only sees a corporate notion of skills. So I mm. think as an educator, that's very, very important. Yeah. 
Uh, what's next for collaboration? Uh, we are, right at the moment, I suppose big telling it. We're, we're looking at theatre. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's next at the moment. So yeah, this bit of the project has, has come to an end and we've moved on to a project looking at socially distanced theatre. So, yeah. Cool. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to welcome Dr. Becky Parry and Chol Otz. Thank you. Just so you know, when the next slide's all your presentations, okay. I'll just pop that slide and on the floor. And it's that one. Thank you. Is it going through? Mm. Oh, God. I can flick. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, we're a bit of a collective, as you can see. <laughs> and I want to acknowledge, um, actually, also, Shabina, as a who was a real inspiration for our project, and I will come, come back to that. And thank you to Eleanor for the introduction to Shavina as well. Um, I will let people introduce themselves as they speak. We'll try and be rapid. Quite a different project, but I think and hope that you'll see um, some, some connections. Um, we took the idea of untold stories as really kind of a provocation, something that ran through our project that helped us think about the stories that aren't told and that we wanted to give young people, um, young women in this case, an opportunity to think about that and think about that in relation to public service broadcasting. But with the tricky thing that most of them had absolutely no interest or, or in fact understanding of what we meant by public service broadcasting. It's not something that's taught in schools. People don't necessarily know how um, media is funded. So although obviously they had lots of contact with public service broadcasting content, they didn't actually frame it in that way. So we, our project was to try and bring um, young women into contact with research and insights from research and enable them to kind of get involved in uh, our, our discussion about the future of public service broadcasting. Um, and we did that through a range of different creative projects. So we sort of drew on um, creative production, um, co-production and co-creation, and hence bringing aboard a, an array of fantastic artists um, and practitioners to work with us. Um, just very, very briefly, uh, so yes, we used arts-based methods. Um, we tried to draw on um, sort of ways of working that were co-production and co-curation. In particular, that led to um, having a, a real-life pop-up van, the Chola van, which Carly will talk about, um, which we uh, was the kind of finished product. The, the end of the project was that the students were creating work that would be exhibited. So they were then taking their work, their ideas, and their creative um, uh, artifacts to an audience. Um, and so that was the kind of... Um, the arc, the narrative arc of our, of our project. Um, young women aged 14 to 25 in Yorkshire, not just Bradford, but actually um, Sheffield, Leeds, and Halifax as well. Um, and as I say, we wanted to uh, enable young people to engage with research. We very much saw this as a public engagement project. Um, I have got way too many slides, sorry. I always do this, I try really hard not to. Um, I'm just going to um, introduce Carly from Carly Clark from um, Chol, who's going to tell you a little bit about Chol. Hello everybody, um, so I'm one of the directors at Chol Theatre and we are a children and young people's theatre company based in Yorkshire um, and at the heart of our practice is co-creation which really underpins our methodology and all our projects in terms of from the design phase of engaging with people about what work and what theatre they want to make um, and that they're really leading it and it is very much co-creation. Um, you can see here is our Cholivan, which was a um, project that very much came out of the pandemic in that we couldn't, at the heart of our work is we go into communities so we don't make theatre for stages, we make them in everyday spaces um, with everyday people and everyday stories so we were like what can we do? Um, so we fundraised and we um, were able to buy this Luton van which we've ripped out and turned into a, a mobile theatre space um, which acts a bit like a carnival van um, so when we drive up it does get um, a lot of attention and it's great for young people because the space transforms into anything for any project so it's been a spaceship it's been um, a carnival of dreams it's been absolutely everything um, so it was really great to have this opportunity to exhibit this work in here 
And similarly to the last project, we did have a digital manifestation of this as well as a material one. So there was lots of kind of paper and lots of blue tack lots on that day. Tack, so we yeah. also had sticky stuff. But we, um, we haven't unfortunately got the QR code on here, but I can share that with everybody. But we have a, in, in Mozilla Hubs, we have recreated our exhibition so that you could go and look at it and all of the artifacts that were made um, are, are exhibited in that space as well. Um, so just to give you a little bit of insight into the people that we were working with, so our focus was very much on um, gender and young women. Um, we worked with a neurodiverse group and a group of young people from Pink College um, who are our specialist work, um, have a lot of um, emphasis on the arts. They're, all of their sites are actually in arts organisations and museums, so they're a great partner for us and a, and a school in Sheffield. Um, and there were groups of young women, there was a kind of very diverse group of young women, I would say. Um, and we also kind of, they then also presented their work to a range of people, both at Cartwright Hall in Bradford and at the school in Sheffield. Um, just to give you um, some indication, they did two di quite different projects. So the Pink College students were quite focused on the future and were doing things that were you know, the stories that they would like to be told in the future. And we started with a visit to the museum at Bradford um, to look at their Broadcast 100 exhibition. So they were kind of orientated to the idea of, um, you know, how are people talking about broadcasting? How are people thinking about this? Um, and, and that, you know, how are they curating and remembering? We had brilliant um, discussions with the curators there who were super helpful in thinking about how we might um, put together an exhibition. Um, they also went to Bussing Out, which I will um, talk about a little bit more. Um, and then as a result of kind of engaging with really interesting uh, content, um, both kind of analog, digital, um, interactive, immersive, um, they um, created some of their own work, um, and including um, interactive digital stories in Twine. Um, sorry, I'm going to just do this at galloping speed. So um, I'm going to introduce Lauren O'Donoghue now, who um, worked with the students um, in creating their twi stories in Twine. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about Twine as a bit of software and why I decided to use it for this project. Um, so like a lot of you, I probably wear a lot of different hats. Um, so I work at the National Video Game Museum in Sheffield. Um, I'm a game writer and a workshop facilitator. Um, I work primarily in Twine myself. Um, it's quite meta, sort of <laughs> pointing to myself, pointing to the screen. Um, but Twine is um, it's an open source, free piece of software um, that anyone can download or use in browser, um, used for creating interactive fiction. Um, anything, if you imagine, um, if you ever played a Choose Your Own Adventure book um, when you were younger, you know, turn to page 83 to go left, page 84 to go right. Um, very similar concept, um, but digitally instead. Um, I'm kind of evangelical about it um, because <laughs> it's incredibly easy to learn and to use. Um, as you can see, it's got this di uh, visual interface so you can very clearly picture how your narrative is going to progress, how everything is going to link together, uh, which I think is quite um, a good tool, particularly for people who aren't very confident with digital skills or particularly with things like coding who feel like they could never do anything digital because it's not something that they're used to. Um, it's quite easy to model and to learn. Um, and if you can type squ double square brackets, you can make an interactive story. You don't need to know anything more than that. Um, but it does contain um, masses of potential for extra bits of scripting um, and complexity for people who do have a bit more confidence. Um, so if I've got all right to just give a couple of examples of students that we work with just to kind of um, demonstrate how this can be used in different ways. Um, so we had a young woman in Bradford who was very not very not very confident with the digital side of it was getting quite nervous when we were talking about things like variables and stuff like that so we kind of put the brakes on with her and went okay what story do you want to tell and she said can i make a garden and we said yeah that sounds amazing <laughs> and she we script we scribed for her while she described this amazing garden that you could explore um, you could go to different areas in it and like examine different things and she created this wonderful story that was just links it was no variables, no code, just links. Um, whereas we had another student who all the way through was going, if I wanted to do this really specific, quite sophisticated thing, how would I do that? What kind of scripting could I do? Um, grasped it straight away, made something really complex and wonderful that had 
seven different endings and a secret ending that you could only get if you did all of the other endings, um, made this really wonderful piece of work. And there were two very different stories, very different levels of technical complexity, but both really expressive of the young people's interests and made in exactly the same bit of software. So it's really flexible and it's also, I really love it because if they are interested in it and they do really get on with it well, they can go home and use it. There's no cost barrier, there's no sort of tech barrier. It's something that you can go and do in your own time for free, which I think is really exciting. Yeah, really, really interesting um, case study help coming from that uh, person, that, the young woman that created the garden as well, because she wanted to be a film director. Um, so there's a big gap going back to what we were talking about right at the start between where she was at and what her aspirations were and also kind of lots of gaps of knowledge in terms of the people that were supporting her including us about how do you how do you enable somebody who has that aspiration to kind of make that progression and um, talk more about that but, um, the other project in the Sheffield School was much more past focused so we asked the students to think about their childhoods and their early experiences of um, children's television in particular um, and here they worked with Meg um, who Meg Wellington Barrett who is a digital artist and photographer um, and we asked them to bring in objects so we did a little it was a bit of a dabble really I would have to say in object ethnography so they were bringing in objects from their childhood um, to help them kind of think about their um, early experiences um, so I'm going to hand over to Meg. Uh, there's lots of double worlds going on <laughs> So uh, I'm also a teacher, so when Becky approached me to do this project as a, as a freelance sort of workshop facilitator, I felt like I had to put myself in the student's shoes. I had to create that distance between myself and broadcasting and objects from our past. And as a photographer, as many of you will, will know, it's making that familiarity strange and being able to view things differently. So at first I, I thought, oh gosh, you know, how am I going to do this? I teach the same age students in my in my day job but for some reason I couldn't see how this was going to pan out so we we put together lots of different concepts about how we can take photographs of these objects and make them strange and the students were just so receptive straight away they didn't question anything I was asking them to do so I was yelling various things like you know get your object go and photograph it in the weirdest place in the room and and they were just doing it and they just didn't think anything of it and and that really surprised me and it was really really um, encouraging to see just how receptive these young people were to these sort of quite bizarre things that I was asking them to do. So I was asking them to do quite abstract photographic things um, and also but they were just so um, they were just so willing but what I took away from it is how similar their experiences of broadcasting were to mine when I was thinking about being 14, 15 and the objects they were bringing in hadn't moved on that much and they were the same characters and they were the same things and that was really lovely to see because I could share that experience with them and just the whole group of young women just was just a, a beautiful sort of group to work with and it was really enjoyable. Yeah and I wouldn't want to give the impression from when, when Meg says they just did it without questioning I would say that <laughs> they, they weren't being compliant and they weren't being <laughs> uncritical and they definitely had questions but what was super fascinating was they loved being off timetable for prolonged periods of time to investigate something really deeply, as did we. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, couldn't resist checking in there. Um, so this is the um, wonderful Bussing Out uh, exhibition that I wanted to just um, reference because this was really at the heart of um, inspiring our focus on untold stories and also helping us to think through how do you um, draw on research in order to tell stories and um, this is obviously just so one of the, the Bradford group um, the, the West Yorkshire young people came to visit Bussing Out but what's important was for us was that it was also it kind of brought into the realm of possibility the making of virtual reality content to our young people. I mean, we, they had a dabble and they didn't make anything, obviously anything as amazing as this extraordinary exhibition which tells stories of children who were um, bussed out from their own communities to um, wider schools. And please forgive me, Shabina, if I express anything incorrectly, but the, so this is a, um, an in immersive experience that felt like it was something close to helping them understand what the kind of behind the scenes would be. How would you make this? Um, and we felt that that would help them to think of it as something that was, you know, think of themselves as makers of this form rather than it being something way in the distance and inaccessible. 
So I wanted to mention that one. Um, and I also wanted, so we did some 360, um, both sound and audio production, mainly playing, just kind of playing with the tool. So it wasn't kind of um, finished products. And the one that there are images from the 360 film on the, um, in the exhibition, but we can't show the film because we haven't got consent for all of the young women. But they did have a play, so they bought in the objects that they bought in and bought them into the screen and, and had a play. And they also, there is some very lovely audio material of them talking about their children's television experiences, which have been edited, um, which for me was one of the most, it's the most joyous part of the project, just listening to them reminiscing about their children's, um, their experiences of children's media. <laughs> Just again wanted to give a little um, thank you really to the museum um, in Bradford, the me Media Museum, because um, we wanted to make our exhibition uh, interactive and, and engaging to the audiences. This was a key priority. And I was looking at all their things and thinking, oh, they've got so much money and we're, we can't do all of these things. And they just said, well, you can make interactives with paper. So this is data from the, the, the young people. Um, I don't, you can't read that from there, but it says things like, my favourite TV character is from um, because she is smart, and we just put little um, paper, lift the flaps on it, and it's and it made it more engaging, and it made it more surprising, and it made the space livelier. So um, yes, I just wanted to name check and thank you uh, to to them for that um, kind of help and support. Um, we've talked about the Cholovan, so I'm going to go into insights really quickly. There, our report does detail this in much more depth, and there are also educational insights, which I haven't included here because I felt that was probably for a different audience, but I'm happy to talk about. Um, really important that we consider that young women are already creative producers, and by that I mean that they were making already extensively in their own lives at home in all sorts of different ways. Um, this is an example of Bluey. Some of you might know Bluey, and this is a kind of whole set of characters that were created um, as new characters for Bluey. Um, but they were all making in different ways in their home lives, and that, that that was an important thing. But that also that we needed to create opportunities for them to make, and to make that obviously the stage of their lives that they're at the moment that has to be in the education space and that there are limits to how that where that happens at the moment um, there's really really powerful um, connections between children young people's identities and their media childhoods so we heard time and time again a very you know powerful and important story connecting something that happened in childhood with a television program, a shared experience. So that kind of sense that, oh, public service broadcasting is kind of somehow not relevant or is old fashioned, didn't really feel like it quite fitted for us. Uh, it felt like it's actually, there's some still some very important shared experiences that probably only emerge through content that is made, particularly if it's specialist for children. Um, so, but I really hope that's not my phone. <laughs> um, I mentioned that it's not a familiar um, term, it's an unfamiliar term, public service broadcasting, and I think that's um, important. Um, but young people particularly wanted to, uh, the, 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 there was a kind of strong sense that there was a need for a better, different representation. Um, and uh, particularly that was in relation to neurodiversity. Um, gender stereotypes came up a lot, um, but there were, um, lots of, in the um, visit to Bussing Out, a lot of the kind of sense of, um, as neurodiverse young people, how we're represented and how we're represented in our city became things that were part of the dialogue as well. Um, this one really fascinated me. Um, lots of the group talked about incidental representation. They didn't call it that, but this idea of um, you're just... LGBT, LGBT character and it's not the story it's not the centre of the story the, the story arc isn't resolving that or it's not a problem that arises from that it's just accepted so this a lot of love in the room for Adventure Time for, for that very reason and that was just one of the examples um, this one I found really fascinating came out particularly in the Twine stories and we felt that we were seeing young people really on the cusp of their childhoods which they were very nostalgic about and the very, very dark and dystopian stories that they were creating in Twine, and actually it kind of was quite clear that they weren't particularly well served in the media that they were engaging with. They were going from child to adult material, and there wasn't much in the middle. 
Um, and so I thought that was kind of an interesting insight maybe for those that are making media. I need to wrap up. These are our kind of implications. I do want to emphasise this is not research. It was public engagement projects, so it's insights. But these were our recommendations. Um, and it, so they just kind of speak to those kind of insights that I um, outlined. And they are, again, on our report. But I think it's really important we stick with that f headline that young, pe young women should be seen as media producers. But to go back to that experience of... Um, our young person who actually did make a twine story and an animation during the period of time, wanted to be a film director, what's the pathway? I think that leaves us with an interesting question. Okay. to creators of technology and that shift in identity. And I was wondering if, if I know you said this wasn't research in public, but clearly you've drip, you know, sort of drawn out insights from it. I was wondering if you could talk about the things we need to be thinking about as a community to encourage more of that shift and getting young people to think of themselves as more than users, but also producers of tech. I mean, so I mentioned about uh, schools uh, and obviously there's a massive role for in education but this is why I worked with these lovely kids. <laughs> because, because in this space in informal education in the arts these people are fighting to get funding to do this work with young people and they're then piloting incredible tools free um, tools you know they're thinking about the ethics of that um, and and more in that space so we need to get them into schools more <laughs> but i think i think that's the space that i found uh but we need to be obviously arguing at a strategic level and lobbying as well because um to go back to kate's point right at the beginning it does feel like we've been saying the same things for a really long time um and actually as meg was saying about the the group being um enthused and we saw that engagement that this wasn't, um, they didn't think of themselves as mm -hmm. yeah. producers or authors of text in that sort of impact. You know, it was quite a big, it was a big step. Are people going to really want to see our images, kind of? Yeah. And I think just to give it, have the opportunity to play. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think a lot of children, like we go into um, drama and education and that cross curricular, but actually give them permission to play. But adults playing alongside children and mm -hmm. young people, that is absolutely integral that you're all enthusiastic and you're that, just that willingness and that freedom. I think is really integral. I think there's a lot to say about reframing as well, because so many of these young people are already using creative digital skills without really thinking yeah. about it, whether that's editing TikTok videos or creating stuff in Minecraft that they don't see themselves as creators. It's just a thing they do. And it can be really empowering to go, no, you're, a, you're an artist, you're a yeah. video editor, you're a creator, you're already doing this. Yeah. And you should, be, you should be proud of that. And we want to learn from you as well. Like it was definitely for me a very kind of symbiotic process of like figuring out what these young people already knew and were interested in and being inspired by their work and responding to it as well. I also think it's much more about opportunity than control. So it's come up a few mm -hmm. times already that, that it's, it's adults that are saying, you know, this is what this world should look like, this is, this is this, but it's given the opportunity. And I think that's why we all had the same sort of experience from being part of this project, that give opportunity and things happen. Um, but there's so many times that people are trying to think, right, well, we have to do this and they have to be this and this is, have, you know, so that's why the, the group of young girls were just, they were happy to do these things because the opportunity was there. Yeah, I, um, I think it was, was kind of going on to um, what I was, was going to ask, which was basically about what that relationship between recognising the young women, I guess like young people in general, as media creators and that kind of role of social media, of TikToks and YouTube and so Minecraft and things like that, in that they're actually making stuff. And was that was that explored a bit more in your work as well? 
as in the things that they were already doing. Yeah. So you can't, it, it's different on the both sides. So Pink College in all of the sites, you cannot escape from what they're doing. Although there was, we did have this really interesting insight. Well, two things really. So the tutors were saying to us, this is, this is mad, isn't it? Like we're really interested in their artwork. We're really interested in their creative lives. But I didn't know that that person had made that, had been working for three years on that dystopian Minecraft world you know and we need to bring this in more so we got some of that from from that um now my uh, 54 year old brain has forgotten the second thing <laughs> um no it's gone um i guess i guess the um the yeah no it's definitely gone <laughs> sorry i mean that they have rich media lives is is, is, was everywhere, yeah. was everywhere. That they have rich media lives that, that they are talking to each other about all the time, but they don't necessarily assume. I mean, we know that from all sorts of research. Um, but I do think they don't, I think Lauren's right, they don't necessarily frame themselves as makers, even if they are making. Yeah, they, they, don't, they don't see it, do they? It's a similar thing, so when I'm teaching, so I teach photography and media, when I teach my students, I don't, I, I'm not aware of the things they're doing because they don't feel to share with me because I'm their teacher and I'm familiar and I see them five times a week. But then I went to this, uh, to King Edward's, um, King Edward's? Yeah. Good, got that right. Uh, in Sheffield, and and they were showing me things on their phone, and they were telling me things about their lives. And again, it's that opportunity to do something a little bit different and see somebody a little bit different. And then you are able to ask those questions and find those things out. And I, I think it is. It's it's accepting that these things happen, and again, stop stopping that restriction on on what we think is right and wrong with it. And I haven't. I'm not just saying this because I've remembered it, and I'm really. <laughs> <laughs> but genuinely, the second point was about careers. Because the follow-up, um, Lauren particularly, so Lauren also works for the National Video Game Museum, and we've had quite, fielded quite a few inquiries, either from the tutors or parents, saying, you know, actually they're really interested. What, 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 what's out there to help support it that? It seems pathway? to be such a, a difficult yeah. industry to break into, and it really can be, but it's actually there's not a, a sort of static pathway into it, yeah. um, and kind of empowering young people with these these skills can be really transformative. I think. And I think as um, on the point of distribution as well, I think having sort of tangible artefacts at the end of the project, like a shareable website where all the stories were hosted and being able to, you know, something that they can go home and show your friends and show your parents, say, look, I've made this thing and here's where you can go and see it. I think that is a really powerful thing. And, you know, saying it's in an exhibition, like yeah. in the Choliban, like it's not just a thing that we created and then never saw again. It's something that's we're, it's being shouted about. I think that's a huge part of that process as well, making people feel like real creators. Yeah, mine was linked really to careers because, um, so, you know, you know, I was saying the creative producers, but would the sector recognise them as creative mm -hmm. producers? Mm -hmm. um, you know? Yeah, no, it's a really good question, which is why uh, I think Lauren's point about building portfolios of work, and that's what, I mean, Pink, we're really interested in Pink College in recognising that, because obviously these are young people with disabilities, um, various kinds of um, neurodiversity, um, that, that the sector would be saying that they're really trying to attract. But there's a very big gap between, you know, how would, like I, I worked quite a lot with the um, young woman that made the garden. We made an Andy Pandy animation together, which please go on the website to look at. Okay. <laughs> um, but what was really interesting was just me sitting there thinking, how would, how would someone support her? Because I'm, uh, you know, to, to, and yet she has like, you know, something very important to contribute. And we say that we want to hear from her. So how, do, how, do, how would she be supported in a channel for the apprenticeship scheme, et cetera? Yeah. And, and actually that's, the so that just leads on to, yeah, because the next thing would be potentially apprenticeships, mm -hmm. which can be used, as we know, as a tool for social mobility, yet in the screen sector tend to be very high level apprenticeships yep. that have been developed, yep. not those entry levels. Yeah. Yeah. So that itself is a barrier, I think, you know, yeah. is the focus on degree level and above in, our se in, in the screen sector, uh, rather than those entry levels in as well. And that's always been an issue in the sector. Okay, yeah. And I know there's people talking this afternoon about careers who've done much more research, so will know much better than I, but that kind of knowledge of, you know, the young people's knowledge of what careers, which, where there are niche places where there might be opportunities for them, and that kind of critical, critical sense of that that Eleanor was referring to, of, you know, not, you know, we, we don't necessarily want them to change themselves to fit to an industry model. We want them to go into industry with criticality and make changes.
Thank you so much. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do talk to Becky in the break. You might be happy to have an occasion. Thank you so much, everyone. Can I invite um, Dr. Rob Eagle up to the stage, please? Okay. Good morning. Um, I hope I am building a bit on some of the themes we've seen in the last um, two presentations. Um, I'll be presenting a bit of um, both re research that I've been doing over the past year um, and some of the public engagement that's come out of uh, this initiative, The Future is Northern. Um, I am a research fellow between the BFI and XR Stories. Um, and so for this past year, I've been looking at how uh, Gen Z, sort of defined as those uh, born between 1997 and 2012, um, how they uh, engage with screen-based uh, media um, in Britain. Let me just bring this up here. Um, an important part of this is um, looking at sort of daily lives and really the role of media within a kind of context, um, a social um, a context around, you know, higher education or work um, and all sorts of other concerns um, and challenges that are facing young people today. Um, so I, I, that was kind of my starting point within the research and then I looked at how um, this group um, envisioned their lives in a decade's time. So we did a bit of kind of future imagining um, and the role that they imagine screen-based media could play in their daily lives then. So what I'm presenting today is potentially cutting through some of the hype and assumptions we have of future media formats and even questioning what is a future media format. Um, simply by asking um, my Gen Z participants um, what they really want um, now and over the next decade. So I've, I've conducted this research um, over the past year, um, and I've facilitated sessions um, of both imagining and speculatively designing the types of media um, that they might want to have. Um, so I'm presenting a, a mixture of top-level stats um, from recent large-scale surveys. Um, so I'll be kind of throwing some big numbers out at you, um, pulling from peers and some, some big uh, studies that have recently been, been commissioned, um, along with my own research findings. My intent here is to present evidence on how both young audiences and young creators um, view the media landscape. So I find when institutions, including us academics, look at the future of screen-based entertainment and storytelling, there are assumptions that this might include something like immersive formats, virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, these technologies on a global scale promise what the tech giants might call the metaverse. Um, so, I don't know, hands up, uh, it's going to be a little audience participation time. Um, if you think, there are three options here. Do you think that in the next 10 years, um, that one, we will be uh, living more in the metaverse? Hmm, there are a few, great. Can we hear all three? Okay. <laughs> two, we won't all be living in the metaverse. The metaverse will be very niche. Or three, what the hell's the metaverse? <laughs> so let's see for one, we will definitely all be living more in the metaverse. Okay, some, some metaverse optimism here, okay. Two, the metaverse will be around, but it's gonna be really quite niche. Okay. And three, no metaverse. Okay, so there, there are no metaverse pessimists um, to that extent in, in this room, which is interesting. Now, if you look at um, some of the major media, uh, to some of the major tech companies such as Meta, um, formerly known as Facebook, Snap, Google, and Apple, they have invested hundreds of millions of pounds into developing what they hope will be an increasing spatialized and 3D form of the internet. 
So looking at market projections and industry investment, it's tempting to believe that the metaverse is inevitable in this next decade. And we've seen visions such as this, <laughs> uh, Ready Player One. Um, it was based on a novel and then turned into a film, which is set in the year 2045. Um, and this presents a future where we all occupy hours at a time in a headset to escape the grimness of our physical realities. Now, you know, this, this has sort of become a blueprint for some, for some people, along with, um, of course, um, some other kind of science fiction novels. Um, so we've kind of seen this, this sort of science fiction uh, view of what the metaverse will become. Um, and that's actually uh, informed um, some of the VR headsets, some of their um, uh, design. So I'll show you a few here. You might be familiar with some of these. Um, so we have the, the Oculus Quest, the Rift, uh, HC, HTC Vive. Um, and there have been a few blockbuster games you know, that really kind of show us what, um, what a popular um, VR game can be. So this is uh, Beat Saber, um, in case you've, you've played that. So there are a few of these, these games and experiences um, that are really quite popular. And we can see through artists and games makers and theater makers um, that you know, there there is a lot of potential potentially within within this uh, within this uh, this medium. Um, artists and theater makers have been really exploring the the affordances since the 1970s. Um, so when we say this is an emerging uh, medium, this also kind of uh, for for artists and theater makers, it's not that new um, in the sense that we have been actually playing with this since the 70s. Um, we've also seen with augmented reality games and uh, the proliferation of face and environment filters um, that you know AR, augmented reality, um, has also been taking off to the point where you could say it's pretty much ubiquitous um, in terms of it's on our phones, it's on our laptops, um, it's on Zoom even where you can put little puppy dog ears um, on your face. Um, Give you a few examples here. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a cosmetic filter I was playing around with um, to imagine what sort of lipstick might uh, <laughs> kind of complement my eyes. Um, and you can see there's Pokemon Go um, there on the left and some of these um, kind of uh, planned AR glasses um, on the right. Um, so we can kind of s sort of imagine what some, some more of these sort of AR um, uh, applications might be, um, particularly through these glasses. And we've seen um, lots of rumors about the new Apple um, glasses, when those might come out. Um, there's always a lot of speculation. There you go. That just shows you a kind of a little filter um, uh, that you, know, you can create. This is just through Instagram. Um, so we're, we're really seeing this through a lot of different apps where you can kind of augment your body and your environment. So if you listen to the buzz coming from Silicon Valley, really kind of up until recently, you could have almost believed that a corporate metaverse with an ecosystem of virtual worlds and VR and AR uh, is inevitable. In this version of the metaverse, we seem to have next to no agency in shaping it. We just have to accept that the next glasses or, Googles, uh, or, or goggles, um, we'll, we just have to strap them onto our faces and then we go into this, uh, this virtual world. A number of major tech companies were, and still some still are, banking on building the infrastructure, software, and hardware for a metaverse that, when ready, customers can just jump into. Now, this has been optimistic and at times risky. Um, and it also suffers from what media theorist Dave Karpf calls the field of dreams fallacy. Sort of, if you build it, they will come. So this is the vision of, uh, of, of the future, according to a lot of major tech companies. And this is the kind of the starting point for my research. Um, and it's part of what I've been interrogating um, through uh, just asking young audiences, is this the, the, the future that you imagine? Is this the future that you want? But before even looking at uh, some of these future um, formats, um, it was important just to map out where are young audiences now? So who are Gen Z? I've looked at a number of studies, large surveys, and reports conducted over the last year or so. Um, there are a lot of findings, but I'll, I'll just present sort of four key trends. Um, and this is what I, I would say is really kind of informing any sort of future media formats we might be looking at. So number one, 
um, uh, a, a trend might not be surprising is that there's a lot more isolation and inequality um, within this generation and compounded by the pandemic. Um, and the, there's significantly more compared to previous generations um, as Gen Z have spent more time during their formative years at home um, rather than out physically amongst peers. This has led to a common sense of a delayed adulthood. Um, that's quite a common term that, that I've been hearing, um, whereby young adults either do not have the economic opportunities or sometimes the skill sets to be as independent as in previous generations. Second trend um, has been really a number of well-justified anxieties, we could possibly call them, around climate breakdown, um, housing, employment, and mental health. Now, some psychologists, uh, such as Jean Twenge, have examined this relationship between social media and the rise of narcissism and a collapse of, of mental health uh, in this generation. Now, their argument is that social media has contributed to increasing social isolation, poor body image, and depression amongst young people. <clears throat> But here, I think it's, it's useful to, to look at some of the work of Bobby Duffy, um, who's a professor of public policy at King's College, um, with a, a look at this uh, recent report um, that he was also advising on um, that's, that was commissioned by Channel 4. Um, they've looked at how, while social media might have a negative impact uh, on the mental health of some users, it's overly simplistic simply to blame social media as the primary driver of poor mental health um, and body image. Social media may become either an escape, um, such as, you know, you see infinite scrolling, um, or a mirror of feeling lost or depressed. But the real root cause is often linked to more s structural, societal, and economic issues, as I've already highlighted. This generation has only ever known financial crises since 2007, constant austerity for 13 years, chaos in post-Brexit Britain, uh, a pandemic, and now a cost-of-living crisis. So the evidence suggests that all of this is really a, a greater con contributor to social isolation and poor mental health than social media. I think a third point um, when we're looking at, at, at sort of the potential of, of media in, in young people's lives is that this generation is also increasingly diverse and they're aware of that. I mean, we're looking statistically at, uh, at uh, you know, a generation where um, uh, there's far more acceptance of uh, you know, different ethnicity, sexual orientation, um, and gender than, say, their parents' generation. Um, so when particular news outlets characterize them as kind of woke snowflakes, um, this is really, um, I would say, well, inaccurate um, and insulting. Um, what I would say is that there's actually uh, an acceptance amongst their peers um, and that they actually uh, are quite often opposing things like racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, Tory politics, and Brexit. Um, and I do have some stats to back those up. <laughs> um, we're also looking, uh, this is the, f the, f the fourth kind of trend, shall we say, uh, at the most networked and media connected generation in history. Now part of this is also these kind of silos. Um, so for every supposedly niche interest, there's a community online that helps you to feel not so alone. So something that came up a lot in some of my interviews in Bradford has been you know, an obsession around either K-pop or anime. And this is something that you really see very you know, absent in a lot of, of our sort of, um, kind of British media environment, um, kind of complete neglect of the actual media um, that, that a number of the young people I was speaking to um, are really engaged with. So if we want to understand this kind of media landscape of Gen Z now and into the future, we really have to understand some of these everyday realities and some of the, the challenges they face and also challenge some of our assumptions. So how does this affect um, the places and how young people are actually uh, engaging with media such as cinemas? Now, coming from the VFI, this is a big existential uh, question at the moment. Um, when it comes to numbers of young people going to cinemas, numbers are not always great. Um, there's the occasional blockbuster, like a Marvel film or Avatar that might bring young audiences into the cinema. But by and large, young audiences are waiting for it to come out on a, a streaming platform. When it comes to TV, the numbers aren't all dire. Um, you know, Gen Z viewers do watch TV often with their parents and families. You have know, things like World Cup, 
Um, and a lot of the big uh, hitter shows like I'm a Celebrity, Love Island, Strictly Come Dancing, Bake Off, um, they still bring in substantial numbers. But by and large, um, there's, there's an increase towards um, on demand. Um, and I believe the, uh, the head of the BBC was talking about um, uh, stopping live broadcast at some point in the next decade. At the same time, you know, we're seeing the rise of TikTok, um, certainly over the last few years, and we can't ignore this um, as, a, as a major um, kind of um, uh, priority for some uh, young people in terms of where they get their news from. Um, there was an Ofcom, Ofcom report last year um, that showed that TikTok is the fastest growing news source um, for uh, young adults. And it's, it's rivaling the number of hours that young people um, are, are spending compared to, say, Netflix. Um, so it's about equal if you're on Netflix and, um, and on TikTok, sometimes at the same time. So we see overall that sometimes the rise of one media format, such as TikTok, doesn't necessarily result in the inevitable death of a pre-existing media format. This is remediation for some of you who are kind of looking at media theory. TikTok is not necessarily killing off streaming services or TV, just as TV didn't kill off cinema. But certainly how, when, and where young audiences engage with media is changing. Um, so this research has led me to um, relocating here. Um, this is Bradford, for those of you um, who recognize the uh, this town hall in the background. Bradford has a growing population of over 540,000 people with 29% under the age of 20. Um, so it's often called you know, the youngest city in Britain. Overall, 36% of the population is from non-white backgrounds, and that's from all of Bradford. Um, but in, in a number of, of areas in the city centre, when you look at the recent census data, we're looking at 70 to 90% um, of Asian heritage, um, specifically in areas around the city centre. So I relocated to Bradford to carry out this research. Um, so I was able to recruit participants from colleges, uh, local university, and through word of mouth, sometimes just by hanging out in cafes um, and kind of <laughs> talking to people, and, and that kind of leads to, to discussions and also leads to much more in-depth discussions. Um, so kind of going from those big stats and the kind of the big surveys to much more in-depth um, uh, kind of case studies. So re I recruited a small cohort of 16 to 25 year olds um, and started asking first what sort of screen-based entertainment they currently engage with. Um, and this included a lot of mobile phone apps, online streaming services, TV and cinema. So I, I found that often the platforms they engage with track with the national trends. Mostly, mo they mostly loved video platforms like TikTok, Snap, Instagram, um, spent quite a lot of time on those daily. Um, I gave them media diaries, so they were able to actually track the number of time, the, the amount of time that they spent um, on these. This is all coming out in a report, so if you want to kind of know more specifically about that, that research, I'm currently writing it up. But this often went hand in hand with streaming services um, and you know, Netflix and, um, and also finding other alternative services. So when we look at a lot of these national trends, we also don't see the specificities of different communities, such as Bradford. Um, so my research participants described growing up in, a, in quite a multicultural place and how that informed their media habits. Uh, so the, the, all, pretty much everyone um, that I came across um, within the study, either they were born abroad or uh, their parents or grandparents were immigrants. And that also shaped how they engage with particularly British made TV and media. Um, quite often they said, I don't see myself in that media and therefore I have no interest in it, um, which really doesn't bode well for um, you know, things like you know, BBC Three even, which was meant to be, to be for them and they said um, repeatedly they didn't, they didn't see anything in that for them. So I said, well, where do you see yourself or where do, what kind of storylines are you interested in? Um, and this is where Japanese anime or Korean miniseries kind of filled that gap. Um, and I, I think what really came out of this, uh, out of these interviews, was, was really an, a, an, a picture of really fascinating uh, sense of really worldwide media, um, not coming from one particular place or another, but also finding a bit of um, uh, jadedness, shall we say, with, with sort of the, the, the British media landscape, or at least a lack of interest. Um, because they didn't see themselves or they didn't see the storylines there that really uh, engaged them. 
Um, we then moved from that into looking at games. Um, and some of my participants uh, really enjoyed mobile games so they could play those um, you know, on the bus, waiting for transport or whatnot. It was kind of nice to be able to slot in um, uh, between things during the day. Um, and so uh, there were four gamers um, that I spoke to um, and some, some will play at home um, and actually what they really uh, enjoyed from PC gaming is the increasing diversity of narrative styles, characters and subjects. And so this kind of, you know, th this, uh, this reflects that sort of finding your niche, you know, that there doesn't need to be one, necessarily one giant overall narrative in terms of gaming culture, um, but that you, you can always find something that really appeals to you, no matter how niche your interest is. So this helped to kind of build up uh, this picture before we started to look at the future, so in the next 10 years. Um, so all of my interviews, my interviewees, um, we, we imagined what Bradford might look like in the next 10 years. So this is, this is Bradford today. And we looked at preferred futures. So there was a bit of sort of, um, uh, if you had the power to shape the next 10 years, if you were put in a position, if you, could, if you could commission the kind of media that you want to see, what would you like to do? So some really interesting discussions came out of this. But specifically looking at Bradford itself, um, there was this kind of small scale optimism, kind of word of the day, um, that there would be more jobs, there would be more, you know, nicer buildings around Bradford, um, while still retaining um, the kind of quintessential spirit um, of Bradford. Um, they also were optimistic that it wouldn't become as flashy and, um, and corporate as, as Leeds, as lovely as Leeds is, um, uh, and, and Manchester. They really wanted to retain a, a very unique uh, Bradford spirit. So a lot of this kind of future scanning um, then also informed um, a, uh, a hackathon that we uh, did in the Media Museum. There you go. So I assembled a group um, of uh, media makers. They were kind of actively um, working already in uh, studying uh, games, um, animation, um, and narrative design. And um, they, uh, they came up with a, uh, this was over 48 hours um, within the, the Science Media Museum in Bradford. And this is the sort of scenario um, that, they, that, they, that they created. Um, so we had a, a 3D uh, animator, um, and you emerge onto the stage, um, and you're having a date, um, basically, in VR. It was really interesting to see the way that they also viewed what VR could be, um, and that controllers don't necessarily need to be in the hands. So they can, you can strap controllers to your feet. So all their interaction design um, was, was to the feet. Um, and they were looking at maybe some of the potential of some of these environments. So it's really interesting to hear what, um, what Eleanor was looking at in terms of um, sort of using um, AI for shaping environments. So there was a real hope that they could use some of these emerging tools for creativity and also for creating um, you know, bespoke environments um, uh, so that every time you play a game, for example, it's, it's a bit different or it's tailored to you. There's a, there's a unique gaming experience, there's a unique uh, environment each time you go into it. Um, so there was, there, I think there was a real optimism that it's not just that this is going, that AI is the end of the world, um, but that this can also be a real creative tool, um, particularly, particularly in gaming. Um, so I think I will wrap up by just saying, um, commenting a bit on kind of some of the next steps. Um, We are looking um, also at kind of some of the legacy of this, um, because I think there was, there was so much excitement that came out of this research and out of this public in engagement um, of, okay, well, where do we go next? Um, so we've been talking about kind of setting up um, some intro sessions for people who want to come in, so it can be peer-to-peer -peer teaching in terms of some of these uh, gaming uh, tools, and also bringing together other digital creators, digital artists within Bradford. Um, and particularly those who are maybe uh, outside of the university system who might not have access to the same um, kind of tools. Um, so we'll, we'll be picking up with that after Eid in, uh, in May. Um, and all the, the findings from the research um, and from uh, this public engagement will be coming out in, in a report. Um, so if you'd like to know more, get in touch. That's me.
Yeah. Actually, it's not, it's not really a question, uh, Robin, it's to all the sessions this morning. And you mentioned the word legacy, and I forgot to say something. I forgot to say something this morning, and, and it was the one job I had in a way. Um, the, 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 the sister research to the BFI research into skills last year is underway now. It's this research around immersive content, animation, games, VFX, all of those areas. And I just want to, um, I want to plug that because the legacy for all the work you're doing, all of you, um, everything I've heard this morning is really important to feed into all sorts of places, that being one of them. So please contact me afterwards. But secondly, because I'm still an old traditional, I'm st a traditionalist in terms of the power struggle, um, and Eleanor, and um, I think some of this should be feeding into our media bill. Some of this should be, and I'm just wondering if it is, the future of children's media, the lack of investment, public service, you know, continuity, is your research feeding into, uh, you know, a moment where you could actually leave a huge legacy for some of the incredible findings that you're already reaching? So it wasn't so. really a question, right? It's just it's like a plea. Give it to I me. I hope so. Yeah, give absolutely. it to the government. <laughs> Yes, and I mean certainly within within the BFI, we're going to be having some some discussions about some of these findings, um, and it definitely it, it dovetails with I think some of the new strategy. There's a new ten year strategy within the BFI, so um, this is yeah. hopefully going to be some sort of yeah. evidence behind some of the decisions um, that we'll be making. Excellent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just time for one question. Oh. I think, and then we'll have to have a cup of tea. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just really quick one, going back to the start of your presentation. I'm really curious to know. Um, the young people that you've spoken to, how do they feel about whether the metaverse is something that's in their future? Do they feel like, yeah, that's definitely going to be what we do, or are they not interested? There, there was a lot of kind of, meh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, sure, but that's, I mean, that's, it's not that sort of such large scale optimism. Um, I think the concern right now is, well, is that going to get me a job? You know, yeah. is that going to find me housing and, you know, in this, in this sort of market? So it's, that's not really a, a big scale concern. It's a sort of nice to have, cool, great, if that's going to be fun, if that, if that fits in already with their priorities in terms of gaming or something else like that. But that's not necessarily going to be, this, this, is, this is going to solve all of my problems in the future. Thank you so much, Rob.